In 2018, I joined Cisco to build and lead a threat research team, working alongside the existing machine learning team in Prague. Throughout my time there, I work closely with the AMP and Threat Grid teams located in the US and Canada. Even though I was hired as a lead, up to the point when I managed to assemble what I call a dream team, I was working by myself as a threat researcher. Today, I am sharing my experience in the form of major tasks, so you can find out if threat research is the right field for you. Let's begin, Spartans. The title of threat researcher is quite broad, and it may or may not include reverse engineering. Additionally, the tasks I discuss in this video might not apply depending on whom your team reports to or works alongside. Regardless, let's start with the first task, review of machine learning inputs and outputs. My primary role involved supporting the projects of the local machine learning team. This required the review of inputs and outputs of machine learning algorithms with the objective of refining existing models. I remember quite clearly reviewing Jira tickets on a daily basis with new IPs and domains that were found by our machine learning models. My objective was to confirm whether these indicators were malicious or not and also find the family to which they belonged. Now to give you context, because we were processing network telemetry collected in real time across of all of our customers, we were seeing domains that were newly registered and potentially malicious. And as you can imagine, if a domain is newly registered, there is not much information about it. And the same applies to IPs. And a lot of times the classification was done from a place of experience and not so much from a place of tangible information. Now, up to the point of me joining the machine learning team, this process was done manually. And as you can imagine, researching thousands of domains being generated on a daily basis, it's not really scalable if you are doing things manually. And that is why, since the beginning, I started working on automating these tasks. And as I will mention soon, I've developed a tool that allowed me and my team to analyze these indicators in bulk and provide human readable reports. Task number two, threat research. Detections are only as good as the indicators supporting them. And part of my job was to keep up with new trends. This involved staying updated with news and also sifting through both internal and external threat intelligence to find new threats. Now, for you to understand some of the challenges faced by threat researchers and even security solutions, a bit of background is necessary. Malware is not like a new iPhone or a new OS X version where there are release notes or perhaps a post on TechCrunch. Now, once malware and its necessary infrastructure is built, they must be put to use. Either the developer uses the malware to infect a machine or the developer sells this malware to a third party so that that third party can leverage the malware to infect one or more hosts. There are several ways how malware crops up to the level of awareness of threat researchers and security solutions. And these are just a few. Endpoint security solutions detect or send malware and suspicious files to the cloud for further analysis. Even if the malware isn't initially detected, it may later be identified through threat hunting techniques against the vendor sandbox. Machine learning algorithms find new malware by processing network telemetry, endpoint binaries, and host activity. Hunting on public OSINT repositories like VarosTotal, and OSINT here means open source intelligence, where researchers and sometimes threat actors may upload samples. The later group does this to test whether their samples can evade detection by existing AVs. This is not really the wisest move from an attacker's perspective, but it may happen sometimes. Threat intel analysts or threat researchers buy or obtain the malware by mingling with the baddies in the deep web. And what I mean by this is that they infiltrate threat groups in the deep web so they can get their hands on malware, attack methodologies, and even potential targets. Samples found by incident response teams working with compromised customers. And when I remember my times at FireEye, this was exactly what happened. We used to cooperate quite closely with incident response teams that were on the field. They were responding to incidents on existing customers or new customers, and they were sharing their findings, such as forensics artifacts and even malware with my team and the reverse engineering team. And finally, posts from other researchers that you can find usually on Twitter or from security vendors. Most teams, particularly smaller ones, discover new malware simply by reading security vendor articles or checking Twitter. 
For teams with more staff, time and resources, hunting through both private and public threat intel repositories is also an option. Now, as for my team, we used most of the methods above, except for infiltrating the deep web or working with the incident response teams on the field because we were not really in contact with them. Working for a company like Cisco has its perks. We had an extensive amount of telemetry being collected, which allowed us to find many new and juicy indicators on a daily basis. It is a dream company for anyone passionate about big data. Now, whether you are a threat researcher or simply someone working in the field of cybersecurity, you will find out that over the years, your intuition is going to be your best weapon. As I mentioned before, sometimes threat intel repositories, especially public ones, don't have enough information. And this is where your intuition comes in. Because at this point in my life, I can look at some indicators such as domains, URLs, or perhaps host activity and immediately tell if this is malicious or not based on my experience for both FireEye and Cisco. Task number three, reverse engineering. Back when I was working as a senior security operations analyst for FireEye, I was doing some reverse engineering. But at some point I've decided that I wanted to become a full-time reverse engineer. And that is the reason why I moved to Prague to build a threat research team for Cisco. Now I wasn't required to reverse engineer malware for the local machine learning team. But I was asked or at least encouraged by the AMP and Threat Grid teams located in the US and Canada, and I was happy to do it, at least for the first two years. The process was usually the same. A ticket was created either by someone or by a tool, and I would volunteer to take the ticket and help. Now, the expected results for each ticket were different, but they tended to boil down to one of three possibilities. One of the possibilities would be that you'd get a bunch of ashes and you were supposed to find out if they were related somehow, if they belonged to the same family. Another possibility would be that a given sample or a set of samples were not running properly on threat grid and I was supposed to investigate why. And finally, and this is something quite expected for a threat researcher, I was given a set of hashes that were clustered together based on behavior and I was supposed to find a malware family for these hashes. Because I loved static analysis and assembly at the time, I did not spend much time looking at the results from a sandbox or even trying to put together the proper environment in my local virtual machine so that the sample would run properly. And the reason for this is that I knew that most samples had anti-analysis detections in place. So it made more sense to me to just jump into IDA and Windows Debugger and skip the formalities. The output for the tickets was quite clear, but I usually went above and beyond and analyzed the samples as much as possible. And the reason for this is that the more information I could extract from these samples, the easier it would be to build detections and also to support future research. There was never a formal PDF document or published report, and my findings were usually added to whatever tracking system we were using at the time. The Threat Grid Sandbox was an absolute beast, but it was not perfect, and some samples that I came across would not run properly there because of anti-analysis mechanisms. At the end of the day, malware detection, it's a cat and mouse game. Task number four, automation and tooling. Hands down, my favorite part of any job. When I joined Cisco, the automation for threat researcher was almost non-existent. Like most cyber fields, you must combat volume, volume of alerts, indicators, and so on. To tackle this volume issue, I focus on building good automation. One of my first tools was called Deep Oracle, where deep means domain and IP. This tool was collecting threat intelligence from both external sources and internal sources of threat intelligence and aggregating the information into a human-readable report. The great thing about this tool is that this tool was able to pivot on each one of the related indicators and collect even more information so that when an analyst was analyzing an indicator or a group of indicators, it would get as much information as possible displayed in front of them. While Deep Oracle was good to analyze domains and IPs in bulk, I still needed a tool to perform hunting. And that is why I developed a tool called Equalizer, which was a Golan command line tool. And this tool was responsible for collecting internal threat intel, aggregating the information and allowing me to pivot from indicator to indicator and find more indicators such as ashes, domains and IPs. Switching to reverse engineering, one of the most time-consuming tasks that I had to perform at Cisco was to look at 
several samples at the same time. Because as I mentioned before, some of the tickets involved me looking at several ashes or several samples and find commonalities or even classify them in terms of family. The simplest way to go about this was to simply look at the results from a sandbox, in this case threat grid. Now this was not always the best solution because many times for the same family you may have samples that behave slightly differently. And what I've seen while I was working at Cisco is that a lot of samples employ some degree of randomization for the names of the files they create, the folders, etc. And the same applies to randomization of domains. And so if all the indicators that are observed on a sandbox execution are actually random, how can you actually correlate samples? You can't. Now, because this process is not so effective, we have the extreme opposite, which requires us to reverse engineer every single sample in order to find patterns based on behavior, binary content, assembly, instructions, etc. Now, the problem with this approach is that it simply doesn't scale. It requires you to sometimes spend many hours, days, or perhaps weeks looking at several samples. As a reverse engineer, you have many tools, scripts for either Windows debugger that can really help you analyze malware and speed up the analysis process. I was never the kind of person leveraging too many scripts or existing open source tools, and I usually prefer to develop my own because they suited my style better. And one such tool that I developed I called VirtualBox Orchestrator. Now VirtualBox Orchestrator was a Python wrapper around VirtualBox API and allowed me to execute samples in bulk in an automated way and also do interesting tricks such as pause and restart the virtual machine as well as running other tricks that I'm not going to disclose in this video to help me cluster samples. Lastly, I worked on a tool that leveraged the VVSect framework to help me unpack the malware samples. VVSect is an open source framework for reverse engineers that allows you to disassemble binaries, step through code, etc. This project was never finished because unpacking has a lot of nuance to it. Final task, cooperations. One of my main objectives was to foster good communication between the local team and other teams at Cisco and even outside. I am confident that I managed to achieve just that. Besides the threat grid and AMP teams, we managed to work with Talos and also Morphisec, which was a Cisco partner at the time. The format of the cooperation was similar, finding new indicators and sharing knowledge to improve both teams' detections. Working with Morphisec was quite a thrill because I had my hands on cutting-edge malware on a weekly basis. One of the biggest challenges of cross-team cooperation especially in areas such as threat research, threat intel, and even incident response, is data sharing. Threat intelligence is a sensitive topic and teams are quite protective of such data. The reason is simple. Threat intelligence is usually obtained using unconventional methods. And its disclosure can lead to the compromise of the teams or people involved in some shape or form. On a less dramatic note, as soon as an indicator such as a hash, an IP or a domain hits one of the well-known open source intelligence repositories such as VirusTotal, threat actors will immediately dispose of their current assets such as malware samples, IPs and even domains, so they can hide their tracks. Never forget that the validity of threat intelligence is constrained by time and secrecy. In the context of the cooperation with Morphisec, I supported one of their blog posts and the link can be found in the description. Memories are as good as the stories surrounding them. And I have memory of a quite interesting sample that I will never forget. Now this one time while I was going through the usual reverse engineering tickets, I caught an interesting sample. When executed on threat grid, the sample would resolve the domain aa.com, which is a domain for American Airlines. Malware performs all sorts of tricks. And one such trick involves testing connectivity by resolving a hard-coded domain or perhaps connecting to an IP. The reason for malware to test for connectivity before executing is that more often than not, threat researchers or even automated sandboxes analyze malware in private networks so that the malware cannot connect to the command and control. This is a smart move if you want to avoid being detected by the tracked actor or actors when you are performing analysis of a sample. 
If the sample detects that there is no connectivity to the internet, usually it just terminates the process and if you are lucky enough, the sample deletes itself. Given that the domain was legitimate, I assumed that the DNS resolution was just a way for the malware to test for connectivity. But when I jumped into IDA and Windows Debugger to step through the code, I realized that the malware was not only resolving the domain, but also connecting to the IP behind it and sending command and control traffic. Now I sat on my chair and thinking to myself, could it be that the hackers managed to get foothold on the American Airlines infrastructure? I was feeling like someone working at Mandiant back when they found out about APT1. I started imagining myself being interviewed, giving a TED talk, and even writing a book about it. One night, I was having a drink with an ex-FireEye colleague at some questionable bar in Prague, where British teenagers were getting shit-faced at a stack party. A classic, if nothing else. As I was explaining my story to him and my findings, he just laughed at me and said, Oh, dude, don't worry about that. That's just domain fronting. And that, folks, was the end of my dream as a TED speaker. Moving to Prague to build a threat research team represented a pivotal point in my life and my career. Working for Cisco and partners alongside people in Czech Republic, US, Canada and Israel was an absolute blast. However, as some of you may know, my enthusiasm toward reverse engineering waned over time. And I realized that the return on mental investment was simply not worth it. I was quite burned out and I decided to switch to a position with more exposure to cloud and automation, where I find myself today. Your experience from company to company may be different, but the core remains. You will have to stay on top of the latest threats and leverage your threat intel and reverse engineering skills to find new indicators and methods to block malicious activity. What you do with your findings is then up to the company you work for. If you are working for a security vendor, as I was, you are going to take these indicators and integrate them in security solutions or cloud sandboxes. If on the other hand, you don't work for a security vendor, then you are going to use these indicators and findings to tune the existing security tools that you have in place so they can block malicious activity on your company. Smaller teams outside security vendors don't usually have the time or resources to do proper threat research. From a cost-benefit perspective, it is better to either buy threat intelligence or simply deploy a good security solution. Competing with security vendors is quite pointless and even dangerous, but that is a conversation for another time. And that is it, Spartans. In this video, I talked about my tasks as a threat researcher and reverse engineer for Cisco with a focus on technicals and cooperations. Your day-to-day -day may vary from company to company, but a big part of the tasks above will surely be part of your life. And because I had a blast working for Cisco and Partners, I would like to leave a big thank you to all the people that work with me from Czech Republic, US, Canada and Israel. We don't disclose names for security purposes, but the people that I'm talking about that are listening will understand. Until next time, stay safe, stay paranoid.